Hello everybody. Can you hear me? I feel like, I feel like I'm taking a lesson. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to this conversation today, all about girls. But before I start, I should probably introduce myself. Um, I'm Sarah Ebner and I write and edit the Schoolgate blog for The Times, which means I write about education on a daily basis. I also wrote a book uh, which came out earlier this year called The Starting School Survival Guide, which is everything you need to know about looking for and applying for a school and then what you also need to know once you get there. Um, I'm also the mother of a girl and a boy, so I feel suited to this discussion today. I'm very pleased to be joined by three wonderful experts today. And let me introduce them to you. Um, Dr. Helen Wright, who's in the middle there, is the head of St. Mary's School in Carn, Wiltshire, and also the current president of the Girls' School Association, although her tenure is soon to end, I think. Um, she was born in Scotland, studied modern and medieval languages at Oxford, and has worked in co-educational boys' and girls' schools. And she also has three young children. Wendy Griffiths, who's here? is the head of Tudor School, Tudor Hall near Banbury and has been there since 2004. She's also chair of the Girls School Association's boarding committee. She's a University of Wales graduate and she read zoology and she's passionate about boarding, physical challenge and extracurricular activities for girls. What's that? It sounds like we're taking off. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> private helicopter arriving. Um, and all her interests are very relevant to today's discussion. Alice Phillips, who's, who's on the end, is the head of St Catherine's Bramley and has been there for over a decade now. She's also the chair of the Professional Development Committee and the South Central Region Committee for the Girls' School Association. Alice attended Kendall High School for Girls and went on to read English at a women's college, Newnham, at Cambridge. Her hobbies include playing the drums, which she says has, in has increased her street cred with the girls at school, and um, not that I'm sure she needed to do that. Our conversation today, as you will know, is about raising and educating girls. It's a huge topic, and one which you can find a lot more about on the My Daughter website, which is dedicated to providing information on this topic, and they've got a stand over there, and they've also got a tie-in book called Your Daughter, A Guide to Raising Girls, which I'd recommend. You can buy that and my book today <laughs> at that uh, stand behind us. There's an awful lot which we could talk about, and I, I do want to take questions, but I thought that we should start with something which kept coming up over and over again when I mentioned that I was chairing this talk today. That subject was girls and their self-esteem or confidence. So how can we work on that, whether in a single sex or a mixed school? I think it's something which affects girls of all ages. Um, Helen, would you like to start with that one? I'll pass your mic. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about that. Um, I, I think the journey of teenagehood in particular, uh, not just through young childhood, but, but into teenagehood, is one about discovering yourself and to learn, learning to like yourself, to believe in yourself. And so much of what we do at school in general is about self-esteem, learning to do well at something, learning to know that you can do these things is about developing your self-esteem. So in a sense, you can't separate out developing self-esteem from anything else that a girl does, a child does um, throughout their life. How do we help them? Well, at school, I think it's very important that we work with parents to understand girls, first of all, and help them grow into the people they're meant to be by making sure they have the right opportunities, that they're supported when they need to be supported, that they're stretched when they need to be stretched. And I think that, that in good schools, great schools, you will have people who understand your daughters and you will feel comfortable with that. Now, there's a lot more to be said on the subject. I'll pass it on to Wendy. I'm sure she'll be able to say more. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's very nice to be here. Um, well, you heard earlier on in my introduction, and one of the things I'm very, very interested in and passionate about is challenging girls. And you may say, well, if my daughter's got low self-esteem, she doesn't want to be challenged. Well, what we now know is actually we have to challenge them in a safe environment. And the challenge can be an intellectual challenge, but actually for a lot of them, it needs to start with little physical challenges. So when your daughter wants to climb the pole or the 
the fence or whatever it is, our immediate reaction is, oh no. Um, and I'm afraid we give them that supportive um, stance in those situations, which actually can begin them thinking about all the possibilities of things that can go wrong. But actually, we do have to let them take little steps all the time. And it's through that that they begin to build their own self-esteem. We can't do it for them. We've got to facilitate them in developing their own self-esteem. So I'm very pro the interests, the sort of things where the ground will wobble occasionally for them, but you're there as a supportive family, and also the school is there as a supportive environment to really bolster them when the little challenge goes wrong. Um, but there will be moments in all their lives when well, however confident they appear at the moment, and I meet that all the time, when parents say, oh, mine's really confident. There comes a time in everybody's life, going through adolescence, where they're not quite sure about who they are and where they're going. So as I say, right environment, and then challenge them, because actually that will add to their self-esteem, not detract. Alice. Good afternoon, everyone, and again, it's lovely to be here. Um, I would pick up on that and go into the whole realm of risk, and I think I'd talk about the thing that is, um, school and home have to work on very carefully, and that is how you manage your daughter's access to the media and the images that the media can present for girls. Now, um, we all know that we are living in a consumer-driven age where making money is an important part of our national economy, and therefore, inevitably, there's a wall of advertising going on pitched at young people. They have greater access to it than ever before through their phones and everything else. And I think how you deal with that, the perfect image of perfect womanhood, which comes all the time at them through their magazines, and it is super perfect, is at home. It starts at home. It starts with how you, let, how you deal and respond to their perhaps first sighting of something that they show you that they must have, be it um, an accessory, be it some item of clothing which you think is far too short, revealing, whatever. And not to go into the hysterical overreaction, I think Wendy was talking about a bit about the unsafe fence. The same thing can happen. You can so easily as a mum, and I am one of a daughter, and particularly I've got a 12-year-old going on 22. Has anyone got any of those? Um, and the immediate reaction you find yourself looking at is, oh, horror, uh, I must stop this. Oh, that's dreadful, you say very quickly. Wrong thing to say. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I wonder how practical that would be for, you've got to take a turn, which is not no, because if mummy says no, you know exactly what they'll do. They'll want it. Um, so you have to think of a way of dealing with the self-esteem aspect of how we dress, uh, what we do, and, and encourage encourage an image which does allow a little bit of the frivolity of teen speak, because that's what they'll do, pick your fight. But equally, hold your own very firm moral line on what's not appropriate, particularly what's not appropriate for what event. And through that dialogue, and I think we'd all say it's dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. Never let your daughter close the dialogue down. Because if it does, you will go apart. And if you look at our book, you'll find that the recurring theme from all the experts is keep talking, go shopping with, allow a few things in that you probably really would rather she didn't wear in front of granny, but at least are okay. And you can work from there. And, and the self-esteem side of how you physically feel or look will then become natural and normal to talk to you about and quite secondary to what we're all trying to do in school, which is what goes on inside which ultimately we want her to be loved and liked for much more than what she looks like. So that will be my contribution. Totally agree that communication is absolutely vital. Um, and girls tend to communicate pretty well and they tend to like to talk quite a lot. So we should take advantage of that. That's, that's something which leads to another issue which comes up a lot, which is girls and friendships, which affects us from, affects our daughters from a very young age and can become something that really is not just important to them but can be detrimental or positive and really intense. I mean, girls' friendships can be so passionate and the, the falling in and out of love can happen from such from nursery school onwards. And I just wondered what, what parents can do to deal with this and also what the school can do. I'll start with you, Wendy, on that one. Well. I'm also the mother of a daughter, and mine's 13 going on 30. Um, my perspective here is um, one that, when I first, she's my only, when I first took her to school, um, one of the things I was aware of very quickly, as you will be if your daughters are of a certain age, four, five, um, a lot of mothers descending on me saying, oh, Katie must come for tea, we must do this, we must do that, which is wonderful because you're terribly anxious that she's not going to fit in and not have friends. But actually, it jumps one step on then, when you realise that actually 
you're part of what we're just describing, which is developing a quite an intense relationship between two little girls, which becomes a dependency. Um, and I would say that I, having done 30 years in all girls' schools and having been to one myself, I, I'm much more uh, in favour of get them to have what we call the posse, which is they've got a good group of friends and they can butterfly around from place to place. So it's swimming with this one, it's maybe a class of some other sort with another girl, it's seeing somebody else for something on a Saturday morning and encouraging lots of friends because some girls, talking about self-esteem issues, can become very needy in their relationships with other girls and actually if it goes wrong it can be disastrous from a parents' perspective, but also the school's perspective, trying to pick it back up. So my best bit of advice on that is keep their friendships broad. They will all make friends. That's the nature of who they are. Little girls are generally pretty good at putting out feelers. Encourage lots of those tentacles, not the one, because it, it could end up in tears. You're right to tie it in with self-esteem, because uh, we don't worry about friendships most of the time if friendships are going well. We only worry about them when they're not going well or when they seem to be unhealthy. And when that's the case, it can usually be tracked down to a lack of self-esteem of girls uh, valuing themselves in the eyes of others and depending upon others for them to be valued. And at moments like that, I think your role as parents and certainly our role in school is to keep saying to these girls, you are, an, you are immensely valuable as, as people in your own right. You are wonderful. You can do so much. It's you yourself who matters, not you in the eyes of others. And uh, one piece of advice which I'd have to parents about that is not to, not always to see it through the eyes of your daughter as she presents it to you, because she needs to be able to offload sometimes her deepest, darkest fears and her worries. And she will give those to you. And you, if you accept them in their entirety, may think that her life is actually a dreadful, terrible one. But in fact, by the very act of her sharing it with you, it's made her feel better. So if you feel that a situation really is terrible, talk to somebody else, talk to her teacher, talk to other people, try and see it in perspective and you will get a much better sense that this is sometimes just a normal phase. Keep up the reassurance, you won't just need to say it once, you need to say it a thousand times and when she's 30 and 40 you'll still be saying it but that's what the wonderful thing is about being a parent. I think I would add to that, just picking up on something Wendy said, um, this business of being released from worrying about what the next person does. Um, girls can be reluctant to take those risks, to try those new activities because they're waiting for a friend to go with them. And certainly in my school I challenge the girls when they arrive with us at 11 to go and try the things that are attractive to them and find people who've gone there as well for the same reason, not wait until the person next to them says let's go because nobody will go or everyone will go to the wrong thing. And I think at that early stage if we can move it sort of seamlessly into school transition as a point here, when you, you, know, you know your daughter's interest and enthusiasm, you've almost certainly had a really good look at the school and what it offers and probably factored those things in as it's a good provision in music sport whatever um, you will be encouraging I'm sure but pick up on anything that the school gives you which also encourages them to open new doors because through those new doors will be the new friendship group that does that or the friendship group that does that and they won't necessarily overlay I think that's the key point that's been made uh, you need a young woman who will take a, an opportunity in later life where somebody comes into the business place and says I'm looking for someone to go to Canada for two years and who won't just say oh no no uh, who else is going but who will say that's a good idea I'll think about that overnight just need to talk to him indoors and who will have a positive thing about it because she'll think that's interesting for me uh, and again all that self-esteem so I, th I think we're broadly on the same theme aren't we here <laughs> surprisingly <laughs> Just wondering, I, I have various other questions I could ask, but I'm wondering if any of you have questions you'd like to ask the panel. Um, there is a roving mic, if so, so please feel free to, to raise your hand, or otherwise I'll just carry on asking mine.
talk about what the advantages and disadvantages are of putting a, a child at a the very early age into an all-girls type of program versus exposing them to a co-ed environment and then transitioning them later in, uh, into their early teens potentially into an all-girls environment where the gender differences may be more pronounced. You, 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 do, ha you do have th three heads of girls' schools here, just, as a, just, just to mention that, but, but they all have lots of experience. That's, that's an interesting question, but in fact, I think the answer is much less to do with co-ed or, or girls' schools than it is to do with practicalities, because when you're looking at young children, when you have a young family, you need a very practical solution to schooling, and you're going to be looking for a good school close to you, and, and often there isn't the choice of a, a girls' school um, versus a co-ed. You're, you're going to make a, a decision based on what is a good school, you should always do that first we would all say that we run excellent schools and that's the most important thing about our schools. So the decision about girls or, or otherwise is actually not quite as straightforward as, as, as that, it's about the practicality. That said, when girls are in all girls in girl environments, they can be girls and they won't lack for a social life. Um, the further up the school they go, they will certainly have plenty of links with, with boys' schools. You will have your own networks around schools as well with with friendships what girls schools do is provide a, a space for girls to be girls so there's something advantageous but I would say that the issue is actually a very different one at that stage The girls at my school come at either 11 or 13, and I'll, I can only give you my experience there. And what I see is at 13, predominantly, the girls who join us have been in co-ed schools, and by that I mean uh, probably nearly 90% have been in uh, co-ed schools and are actually looking for something different now for whatever reason. They've sort of done that. Um, at 11, interestingly enough, um, it's the other way round. Most of the girls who join us at 11 have come from single sex schools and I can't, I wouldn't like to comment on the merits of either of those models, but what does seem to happen is girls at 11 are, have already established the idea that that's where they want to stay and their parents have similarly decided that's where they want to stay. I will be honest in saying some of my 13 year olds are quite interview, interesting at interview because I'd say, you know, all girls now after co-ed and they'd say, yes, what a relief. Um, but that's, you know, by that stage they've made their decisions. So uh, I hope that helps. My school has a prep school which starts at four. So I'm taking the broad spectrum of the age range. Um, I put my own daughter into that because it was there for practical reasons. Um, I don't regret it at all. Uh, I think at various ages it's less relevant for me than at others, but I think fundamentally it's the decision for your daughter at her age and stage. Um, some children are remarkably outgoing age four, some are not. Uh, mine has been a lonely only all her life and I have now put her into my school which we live next door to as a boarder in order that she can have some distance from me and have a sibling experience because she hasn't got any siblings. Um, I, conversely, grew up in a boys' boarding school in the north of England where I had four natural brothers and 64 surrogate ones. And from that experience, as a fairly plain Jane teenager, I'm not inviting any compliments, and a pretty plain Jane adult, I discovered quite a lot about what, for that girl type, being daily judged on what you look like can be like. Um, and for me, it wasn't right. My father rightly sent me to the local girls' grammar school where I was very well educated and I suppose I've become a bit of a crusader for normal girls and just taking the pressure off them between 8 o'clock in the morning and at 4.30. What I would say to you is, remember when you're looking back and thinking how you were educated, and I speak particularly to the ladies in the room, um, these young people have got the phone in their hand. And if you watch how they interact with new people they meet, the first question after, hello, what's your name, is what's your number? And so their interaction with the opposite sex is actually quite profound <laughs> from quite an early stage. And therefore, I think there's far less to worry about. Um, the agitation in my school for socials is still there, but it's nothing like what it was 10 years ago, because they create their own. And if in our schools they have lots of girlfriends who have lots of boys at lots of different schools, their friendship circle is going to be much wider. And the catastrophe of the great romantic breakup in the school context is not going to be so pronounced. 
So I, I think it is genuinely about your type of girl um, and looking at her, and it comes back, doesn't it, to keeping in dialogue with her, truly knowing her. And perhaps, dare I say it, parents, because we're all guilty of this, recognising that there will come a point where she isn't you, she isn't her father, I speak as a mother, she's her, and that might be different from you. So I'll pass that on. Just, just add my experience here as well. I, I went to a, a co-educational primary school, and at 11 I went to a girls' school association, girls' school, and I loved them both. And I had lots of friends from my primary school, boys and girls, and lots of friends at my secondary school. And I, I did like the lack of pressure at secondary school from that age you had from being all girls. Um, but I also know my daughter is nine and she's at a mixed school now and she loves boarding school books and those sort of traditional girls. And she does say, oh, I'd like to go to a girls school sometimes. But then she has lots of friends who are boys. So I, I'm not sure in the reality, if, if, I, if we had taken her out of that school, she, she would want that, but maybe she would at 11. And I think everyone's got their own, there are the practical reasons, but there's also personalities in there. And there's also extra things like, is there a boy in the house? You know, is there, are there brothers around, which can make a big difference? Um, or have you got three daughters, so it, maybe you feel they need uh, more of a male influence around. Have, are there any more questions? Has anyone else got a question or shall I move on with my next question? Well, I think this is probably quite relevant to lots of people here and it's a, the combination of how to encourage your child to do things like their homework and their piano and violin practice um, and how to not be overbearing or tiger motherish. Um, I mean, I, I read the tiger mother book, which was very entertaining. And at moments I did think, should I be doing this with, you know, should I really be a bit stricter and make my daughter do an hour's piano practice every day? And we have upped it to 20 minutes now. So <laughs> we're, we're on the right lines. But there is a, a danger of you thinking, well, I don't want to be too pushy, but also will they miss out if I don't tell them they must do this kind of stuff? Um, Alice, do you want to start with that one? Well, I think the homework thing is quite straightforward, but it it involves somebody at home, and I think still culturally that will tend, not always, but to be mum. Um, it, it's, it involves somebody holding the line. And parenting, in my experience, is almost 90% you know, holding the line, because that's what gives them the security. So, I mean, I say to the day girl parents in my school, if the boarders get an hour and a half to do their homework, age 11, it's ring-fenced, they are allowed access to a computer to do it, the games, the Facebook programmes are all switched off at the Wi-Fi, um, and this is a time where they learn to work smart, and they must do it all in that time, because then they're motivated to the next fun thing coming along. And to a day-girl parent, establish when that time's going to be. Negotiate. If Monday is external ballet class or piano lesson, fine, but the hour and a half will be later, the supper will be put in where the sugar shot is needed, where you know that you can get the wine down, um, but then you must hold the line. And if then it's, oh, but I want to watch, comes up. No, 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 we have this marvellous technology these days. I will record for you, um, and we will watch afterwards. I mean, little practical things like this allow you to be terribly supportive, and you get the energy into the homework in a confined space. So then what do you do when they moan and say they haven't got enough time? Well, you have to tell them how to negotiate with school to say they tried their hardest. And if you don't think they tried their hardest, make sure they're doing some of it in front of you. Try and avoid the distractions. Try and encourage them that the electronic revolution is a marvellous thing for the casual side of life. But in prep time, it's or homework time, it's for doing homework. Try and cut down crazy amounts of research um, because that's not what they're supposed to do with their prep time. And I think when it comes to the practice and all that, I mean, I've got a daughter who, um, in theory, plays two musical instruments. Um, I think you have to set some parameters on it, but you also have to accept that, you know, ultimately, after a couple of years of bludgeoning, she may not be the next Tasman Little. Um, but equally, she's got some good educational um, experience out of playing the violin for two years. She knows how to read music. She's got some posture. She's learned that it's difficult, so she'll appreciate music and, and quit gracefully. Uh, by the same token, if you find that she's, you know, left in a room for 10 minutes, suddenly one day you're thinking, where's she gone? And she's still playing. You have actually got into, into her head the pattern of practice and she's started to enjoy it. And that's a good moment to look out for. It's quite nice. We're not quite there with the piano in our house, but we're getting there with the violin. <laughs> okay. Of course, the real answer is boarding school. Um, because... <laughs> 
<laughs> and I speak because here you have three heads of wonderful boarding schools. And uh, one of the reasons we really believe in boarding is because it's that whole education. But one of the tremendous advantages of boarding schools, I'm absolutely serious now, is um, the, that it gives you as parents proper parent time when, when your daughters are at home because there's a structure about school. You know yourselves that when there, there can be difficult times at, at home, sorting out homework, going to school, talk to a teacher, and they'll say, oh, no, 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 she's perfect. Um, everything, she, she, she's very attentive, she listens. It's because there's a different relationship. You have a different relationship with your children from the one that your teachers do in, in school, and it's quite appropriate for that to be the case. So in a boarding school, all of that, all of that learning is wrapped up into the whole, so boarding schools are great. I'd just like to pick up on the original point for a second, which is with younger children, pre our age group, when they come to boarding school, and you're living in an environment where there are lots of children doing lots of different activities, and you've got the academic ambition as well coming into it. And every parent wants the best for their children. There isn't anybody that I've ever met who doesn't want anything but the best. And, and the role of a parent is one of juggling, and in your professional lives, I'm sure many of you have learned to juggle your life, your children, uh, and also coming back to, you know, everyday things like shopping and so on. Um, the children have got to learn to do exactly the same thing. What I think we probably all agree is that that's had to happen a lot earlier for young people, that they find from a very early age that they've been involved in many activities, lots of academic subjects. You know, I have people saying to me, oh, why haven't they started Spanish by the time they're nine? And you think, well, hang on a minute, let's get through some of the basics first and let's get to the stage where we're feeling confident in everything that we're doing. We want them to have inquiring minds, but actually we can knock that out of them if we spend all our time putting them in front of a computer where they're doing research projects and so on. So watch what they're doing. Alice suggested this earlier. See how much time they're investing in pieces of homework but you must try and balance that with extracurricular and the balance is the key word they do need to develop interest they do need to have time to play and they must that's a really important part of their growing up that they still have the time to be in the garden climb that fence that I mentioned earlier jump off something get dirty and so on because yeah and even be bored and actually find the I am bored, what shall I do to occupy myself? Because often when they meet, meet us at 11, parents, I have to explain the difference between extracurricular and entertainment. We don't entertain them, we actually have brought them to a stage where they will entertain themselves, but actually we provide education, whether it be out of the classroom or in. So balance, I think, in all things. Do you want to pick up on that? Yes, I was just going to say, um Something that happens in my boarding house, but actually I replicate, because we, we do have some day students, and I'm very happy to relate very closely to day parents as well. Um, we, the boarding house, which is of the 11 to 14-year-olds, has a thing called golden time. And golden time is actually the precise hour where nothing is organised for them. And it's their golden time. And they're encouraged to view that as a positive opportunity. They can do in it what they will. I mean, they can practice, they can go to the art centre, they can do things, all of which they could do at home. You could get the craft kit out or whatever. But they are required to do it for themselves. And if they want to, um, they can watch the telly for a bit. It really doesn't matter, but it's their learning to control them, their own input. It's quite a nice term to use even in a domestic environment as well. Golden time. It's Jeremy Tomlinson, who is the registrar at Lansing College. And in about five minutes, he will, as I say, be talking about how the independent sector works with your child to find the right universities and courses. I just thought I should probably let that person finish speaking. Um, I think we're out of time, actually, although I was just about to ask the ladies when they thought our girls should be allowed their own Facebook accounts, which is uh, something that comes up constantly. 13, you said 13, OK, because the demand is coming right now, I have to say, and mine is nine. But what I would say is, if you say 13, they'll go around the back door, have a family one from very early on, have a family one that she can help input to and add things to, and you encourage her in the proper use of it. And it's amazing how then they become the editor of the family one, ticks a job off your list. Of course, you could give them a blog and they could do their own things on that as well, which is a nice way. And then, of course, you can keep an eye on it, which is uh, what we did with ours.
Oh, parents, Ooh, that's a different topic. Should you befriend your child on Facebook? Probably when they're younger, but when they're older, they really won't want you being around. Um, thank you very much to the panel today. It was really fantastic, really interesting stuff. And thank you to you all for coming. And as I say, the, the My Daughter book is available behind you. Thanks. <laughs>